to uh, also record in the session. And uh, uh, I think we are ready to start. So good evening to everybody. Uh, as you know, I'm Cecilia Messina from the Career Service Office of Domus Academy. And together with me today, we have uh, Chiara Diana. She is uh, our alumni and uh, she is actually Chief Design Officer Europe at Frog. And uh, together with us, there is also Silvio Cioni. Um, he, maybe you already know him. And uh, he's, uh, um, so Silvio, tell me if I'm not wrong. You are general manager at Sketching. True. And uh, yeah. you already collaborated in Damos Academy many times in the past years. And uh, uh, you are also a teacher lecturer in Domus. So uh, if uh, our students uh, didn't have the chance to meet you um, in the last weeks and months, uh, there will be the chance to meet you soon, I guess, apart from today <laughs> online. Mm -hmm. uh, so welcome to everybody. We have now five, mm, 15, 16 almost uh, attendees. And uh, uh, I think we can start. So welcome again to everybody. I hope for all our students and uh, uh, recent alumni that you will, uh, let's say, um, join and uh, appreciate uh, the webinar. This is uh, a part of uh, um, Connecting the Dots webinar and a part of uh, the Professional Accelerator module for the current students in Domus Academy. So the attendance is uh, required and uh, um, for your, uh, let's say, next uh, step uh, and uh, your curricula. So Silvio, I leave the word to you. Thank you, Cecilia. And uh, thanks to Domus Academy for having me this evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of uh, having Chiara Diana with us. Welcome, Chiara. Hello. Hello. Before we start, uh, we have to say that we have known each other for a long time. And so this conversation will be friendly and maybe very relaxed, I hope. But my my hope is also that everyone will have a great time uh, this evening. Uh, so let's start with a short introduction from you. You are currently Chief Design Officer in Europe at Frog. I know it's a new role for you. Would you like to quickly describe us what are your main responsibilities? Yes. Um, you're right. Uh, I'm not new to Frog, but I'm new to this role. This is a role that I stepped into in the moment in which Frog became part of Capgemini Invent. And by doing that, it merged uh, with the expertise and teams from IDEAN and Fahrenheit 212 in Europe and uh, globally. So we call this kind of new step in the Frog journey, a uh, new era for us for the scale of the transformation and the scale of the challenges and opportunities. But um, before talking about the new era, that is my responsibility now, maybe we can talk just for a second about, yeah, uh, about yeah. Frog um, that maybe many people know already, but it's worth spending a uh, spending few words. So I don't want to be too presenter and uh, kind of pitchy, pitchy mode, but I think two slides might help us, uh, might help us a bit. So Frog, maybe many of the people on the call will know Frog. I knew little of Frog Chiara. actually when I joined Frog. Chiara, sorry, we can see the, the menu. Okay, now it's okay. fine. Now it's Great. better. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so I knew little of Frog when I joined Frog. Maybe you are much more prepared than I was at the time. But uh, Frog is, uh, was born more than 50 years ago now as a design studio, an industrial design studio in its roots. Uh, and we were working on the top the projects such as the Sony Walkman or the Apple Snow White first design language system. And the thing that Armut was advocating very loudly, it was the need to really not only look at the functional value that objects would bring uh, to daily life, but really putting emotions as a key component to that. And that in a way was a radical shift in the way in which design was approached and has been core to the way of working on Frog for, for, for a long time and still today, despite the fact that we have been kind of going through several rounds of changes and what design means today is quite different from what design used to mean uh, when Frog was born uh, um, kind of 50 years ago. So now we talk much more about uh, uh, embracing connectivity, embracing mobility, embracing design as a leverage for transforming organization. And today, even much broader, new frontiers of interactions and 
what else kind of the scale of design impact are even are even larger. So these 60, uh, six decades of work has kind of marked the journey of frog. And as I said, today we are at a critical moment of this transformation. We call it a new era, uh, kind of few days ago, we launched the new era to the market. So this uh, webinar is kind of timely for that. And we like to call us in this new era, a creative consultancy firm which brings together the two worlds of creative and consultancy, which tends to be one against each other sometimes. We believe that there is an incredible power to bring them together uh, and bring them together by bringing together creativity, strategy, design, and data to really help uh, those that want to make a change, those that are willing to take the risk, to reinvent their business starting from the customer. So that's kind of the ambition for Frog, uh, if you if you would say, the ambition of the new frog of today. And in that, I think that design plays a key role. Design is quite central to this transformation. And uh, it's also a significant part of the talent pool of this, new, uh, of this new frog globally. So my responsibility into that is really uh, bringing together these kind of uh, various designers that exist across the region and uh, across my friends and the rest of the globe, and uh, um, in a way shape what design means to us and what design can mean to our clients and what design can mean to the planet, but also how design can contribute to the work of Frog. And so how design can contribute to, to the business, business results. So if you say, uh, what are your daily responsibility? I would say that on one side, there is this point of talent, really structuring the team, growing the team, inspiring the team, driving initiatives that push us forward and push us where we want to grow. On the other side is about the offering. So how do we speak about design? What is the next challenge that we need to get equipped for and how we shape the narratives and the conversation in order to address those new challenges, which new people we need to bring into the organization, which new capabilities. And the third, that is probably the one that remains the closest to my art, is really winning and delivering the work. So shaping proposals, leading the team and coaching the team as they, as they do the work, because I believe profoundly that the quality of the work that we do, it's critical to our business success and it's critical to retain our talents. So for me, while it's the last in my list, it's the closer to my art, but I also believe that it's kind of the engine for running Frog the best. Thank you, Chiara. Let's go back now to your days in those Academy. Which course did you attend and why or when? And why Domus Academy instead of any other design school? Yeah, I would say maybe back at the time because I'm quite old now. <laughs> so it's more yeah. than 20 years ago. There were not so many design schools, just to say it clear and loud. Mm -hmm. And there were not many design schools that were touching topics related to design and innovation. Um, it was, it, it was year, I think, 2002 when I joined the master. The master was the master in eye design, was named the eye design interactive objects, so spaces and services. And it, the way in which I decided to join was quite random, if I can say. Sometimes I think that my life has been decided just by random encounters with great people along the journey. So I was just graduated at that time at uh, Politecnico. Uh, where I studied design and Polytechnico was uh, one of the few university in, in Europe that was teaching design at that time. It was a, a moment in which web, uh, Bluetooth, mobile connectivity were kind of uh, rising up, but the, the academia was very, very slow in receiving them. So only few professors were interested in exploring those frontiers. I was struggling to find professors that were supporting my final project, which was about Bluetooth and museums. So when I finished university, um, I really felt that I wanted to find a job. I wanted to find a job where I could practice some of these things that I was interested into. And then my mom read about a scholarship in Domus Academy 
of this new master that kind of sounded interesting. I thought it was much more about information design than interaction design as it came out to be. Um, and, and the boundaries of what that could mean uh, were kind of quite blurred as the reality did. So I wasn't sure. Uh, and I think I met you, Silvio, I met Alessandro, and I met uh, Claudio that at the time was the course lead uh, for the interview. And I think that they kind of, you all convinced me that despite it was very vague, it was probably something interesting to jump on. Uh, well, I, I remember it perfectly. Uh... It was the beginning of an exciting journey for all of us, probably. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the Master in Eye Design. Uh, is there any specific uh, workshop or project uh, you still remember to date? Why was that so meaningful to you? Yeah, maybe uh, before we speak of a workshop, which, uh, which we, can, we can definitely go to, I want to share a bit about the, the context of the Master. Because as I, I think I was posting that yesterday on LinkedIn, it really, for me, I believe that that marked an important step in my career where I'm today. I think that it was the first edition of the master uh, and you could really feel that it was the first edition of the master. The domain in a way was nascent. There was not much uh, kind of theoretical or academic background on the topic. Uh, but also it was not very much defined. You could feel it from the title that was long like a paragraph because lots of things were interconnected uh, and we were willing to explore. So there was a lot of energy, a lot of uncertainty, long working nights, uh, but also a sense that you could really make a change. You were on the edge of something that was going to be very transformative. And I think that feeling, that energy was uh, probably a big part of the beauty of uh, the experience itself. So we didn't have the given frameworks, uh, uh, customer journey didn't exist, the concept of wireframe didn't exist. Uh, there were not a lot of benchmarks to look at other projects that you, you could not do a kind of uh, landscape analysis because it was kind of nothing to benchmark against. And we were extensively inspired by art and by nature in identifying what could be done really on the, in that land of kind of very exploratory land of possibilities. So I was, uh, I was looking in my old, uh, old disc uh, for uh, some of the images that I could share with you and with the audience today about those projects. Uh, honestly, I have to say, uh, most of the things were done in flash. So finding online browsers that can support Flash has been already a challenge. Uh, and all the images are very pixelated because as I said- And small I'm probably, and and very small. small. Yeah, exactly, and very ugly. Um, so the, what I found in, in scanning this landscape is uh, the picture that you see on the left that were these kind of experimental projects, art installation, some preliminary 3D graphics. Uh, environment. But what we were doing is more what you see on the right, which was the initial concept of ecosystem maps in which we're trying to understand the interplay of the different components, either human behaviors or technology reactions, and how all of them together could make sense in delivering something new, and a lot of storyboarding. I was looking for a nice, you know, Photoshop, photorealistic image. There was nothing of it. So we were really kind of trying to find, not only explore the territory, but also try to form the tools that you use to um, explore a domain that was not uh, uh, very much defined, defined yet. So I think that every workshop uh, was, was an experience. You could tell a long story, uh, lots of emotions about each one of the workshops. And I think that the workshop were really marking our experience, uh, our experience at Domos. There is a, I think that there is one that uh, I, it's close to my heart, but it's also close to my journey. That is the one that was called Iways. Uh, and this is a, uh, a workshop, I think it was the third or the fourth uh, in our journey. And it was on the topic of exploring future scenarios for air traffic control. So, it was aimed at understanding how we could leverage new technologies and new forms of interactions in order to improve the way in which the people that are 
controlling the planes could do that better. So less planes can crash or people on the plane can get to the best, uh, the best support. So I think what, why, it was, why it was interesting, particularly interesting to me, because in order to do that, uh, we had to deep dive on the topic quite a lot. So we, we learned, we, we reviewed a lot of papers that were describing the workflows that these people were going through. We had the opportunity to have few of them, few of those air traffic controllers coming to Domus and telling us about their work. We could interview them about what were their pain points, which were the critical moments that they need, didn't know how to solve. So in a way, it was a first step into what now is common uh, uh, design research in the in the projects that we do. So that part of initial exploration really for me marked a difference compared to the other workshops and informed my way of thinking of project in the future. I think you remembered that as well, right? Yeah, I, I remember that that project it was quite challenging. I mean, uh, because the domain is so uh, particular. So it was very nice to, 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 to have a look again to, to your project. Uh, what happened after completing the master in, in Domus Academy? What were your next steps? Uh, I know they still crossed with Domus. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think that the, why I selected this project, because I think that this project was a very interesting bridge to my next steps in, uh, in Domus and my next steps in, uh, in the career. Um, so this project, this Highway, Highways Workshop, was part or somehow connected to a larger research uh, program that Domus Academy was carrying on at that time within his uh, research center on the future of air traffic control, as I said. So at that time, um, Domus Academy had a research center, which was named DARK. Uh, I think few people on the, on the call were part of this crazy group of people, the small, small team of professionals that were trying to be on the edge of uh, what design could be. So this DARK, this research center was existing on the side of the educational activities, was interconnecting with the educational activities every year and then, as it was my case. And the mandate of DARK was really to explore um, the new territories of design. We were speaking a lot at that time about humanizing technology, how you could connect human and tech in a meaningful way that is respectful of, uh, of human, human beings. And we were working uh, either in collaboration with other research centers in Europe, it could be the Philips Design that was really pushing the experimentation, the Fraunhofer Institute, even the Royal College of Art in London was part of this kind of scattered crew of crazy people. And, and with visionary clients on the other side. So sometimes you had public or semi-public institutions that were funding those experimental projects. Sometimes you had the Nokia, the Fujitsu of the case that were, uh, wanting to explore something beyond the boundaries of what was obviously possible. So uh, that was the reason to exist for, for DARK. And when I completed my master, uh, I had the opportunity, uh, maybe I made good impressions uh, to you and the rest of the crew in the course of the master, to be asked to join the, the research center at the time. And the, the, the air traffic control project was uh, the first big project uh, that I was engaged uh, on in the um, in uh, in Domus. So here, oops, here you see the professional side of it, right? So this picture is the picture of the concept that we were able to explore as uh, students in a was four weeks or five weeks uh, workshop, and then we took it to a next level. I think we worked on that for almost a year, doing what you see on the top, which was real interviews in context observation in the control towers to deepen our understanding and test some of our design hypotheses uh, with air traffic controllers that you see on the top. Um, one of the biggest barriers that we learned is that they work uh, in an environment which is very, very cold, just because all the machines needs to be safe. 
So they have to go and work with all the kind of uh, the jacket for the entirety of the day, which is one of the biggest pain points, nothing to do with technology in a way. And so we were learning from them. And then what you see on the bottom is how we brought to the next level our redesign of the tools and the interactions that they were having in order to perform their job. So what you see on the right, it was a revision of this kind of big streams that they use, uh, both at the level of the setup, but also at the level of how the interactions, which tools, which digital tools they need in order to better manage what you see at the center of the screen, which is the um, the space, the part of the sky that they have to manage. And what you see on the right is how that can interplay with a personal device, which looks like very much like a folding, uh, a folding big phone that now we have in the market uh, that was enabling them to be aware of what was happening before and after turning, turning the shift. So uh, this was, this was the, my first step into, into DART, my first step into the research center where I stayed for, I think, almost uh, eight years, uh, running several, several projects uh, uh, with amazing great people uh, along, uh, along the journey. And then, if, uh, if you want to hear what was next, because it's not, I, I have 10, 10 more years of my finished. life. So it's not finished the story. Um, my first child, Filippo, was born. Uh, he was five months old. I think you might empathize, uh, uh, female and male, that when you get uh, new children in your life, it's quite a transformative moment. Uh, you make yourself a lot of questions, but all the, all the things, uh, um, you are in an open mind enough moment to question some things that were given for granted. So for me, it was really, the moment to make a change, to make a switch. Uh, and I felt that the time was arrived to start testing my skills, my understanding uh, closer to the reality of the market. So try to understand if I could bring these more um, exploratory exercises in something that could really get impact on people's life sooner and uh, bring, things, uh, bring things to market. So that's the moment. Uh, and maybe I can exit this presentation <laughs> and stop sharing and you can see my face. So uh, that was the, the moment in which I decided, I decided to join Frog. And here again, I think that the encounter with Frog was quite uh, casual by people relationship more than me intentionally searching for it. But I think it was the right, it was the right move. It was the right move. So I joined Frog um, as a senior designer in uh, 2010. It's more than 10 years that I'm there. I'm still there. <laughs> so in these 10 years, I, I first started with a very, very much more the focus on the Milan studio, uh, helping to set up the digital product practice in the first place, then establishing the service design discipline for Europe that didn't, uh, that didn't exist. I draw some of the uh, studios that were just formed like the, like the London one, and then to progressively more responsibility over the design discipline overall. So um, guiding the first integration, moving from thinking of studios as independent countries, but more as a region and the second round of it. And now we are in the third wave of it. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's interesting and every time it's causing, it's causing a new challenge. And if I reflect on why I've been uh, staying at at Frog for such a long time, I think it's because it has always been different and the, and the design itself kept changing quite a lot along the way. So keep exploring and keep learning uh, and meeting with great people, both from teams and clients is kind of the reason why it doesn't uh, feel boring or not yet. Let me say that your challenges are bigger and bigger probably. Yeah, and that's why sometimes you feel the need to just uh, design a nice PowerPoint <laughs> slide and spend 30 minutes on just beautifying it. Sometimes uh, is a, is a, is a, a, nice, a nice purpose. Uh, your professional journey is impressive, Chiara. Uh, please tell us again about your current role. I mean, what are your typical daily tasks? And... Uh, what do you enjoy most and why, apart the PowerPoint uh, 
<laughs> beautification beautification yeah. task yeah i think i i can go back to the to the things that we were mentioning uh, mentioning at the beginning right um so we were speaking about the talents we were speaking about the offerings and we were speaking about uh, about the work and this is really kind of what is making what is making my day then the proportions depends on uh, uh, fluctuate a bit according to and i'm sure everyone uh, empathize with that mm -hmm. in which moment of a project you are in which moment of a proposal you are but also in which moment of the organization transformation you are and i would say that this for me for sure is the moment in which there is a lot of focus on getting and establishing uh, and getting function these new larger communities of fraud so if you if you look at the from a talent perspective it's really about setting up the teams i believe that thoughtful resourcing so deciding who is going to work on which program is one of the most powerful tools that we have in order to support people growth because projects makes the 90% of the experience of a talent uh, in in their time you could do theoretical um, education on the side but that's not what is the engine for their growth. So finding the project without the right stretch, it's an art, I believe. And that's kind of taking a lot of, uh, taking a lot of my time, as well as defining who we want to hire, uh, making the strategic hires uh, and uh, shaping and driving initiatives. Like now we are establishing our global community of practice or establishing our global, refining, I would say, our global career framework, how we name our disciplines, when is that you're ready to move to the next steps. So those are all the topics that are in the, in the bucket of talent, which is quite big at present, yeah. I would say. And, and then I think the, the, the counterpart to that, which I love to have as a counterpart. And I advocated, I, I advocated strongly when shaping my job role for the new position to be close to the work. I think if you are not close to the work or not closing to talk to clients and selling the work, you start to have these two dimensions that detach one from the other. And you make decisions on strategic direction for the organization that are not matching the reality of talent's life and not matching the reality of client challenges. So, so for me, staying close to the work is because I like it, but I think it's also very strategic uh, in order to make sure that uh, we are an organization that is connected with the things that are happening. So that means that I join once a week, I join the standups with the team on the key projects that I follow, typically the projects that are with either critical clients or projects where we are testing something new. Um, I join some of the uh, thinking or ideation moments uh, and spend time in coaching some frogs on the programs themselves. And then I really drive business, still drive business development or help people drive, uh, drive business development. So you ask it, what is the moment? I think how you ask it that, what's yeah, the what moment that I like the most? most? So do what you I enjoy the why? most? I, I have to say, I enjoy a lot going to the studio. Uh, we have been away for, from the studio for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we restarted going to the studio, I think, and now it's several months. The casual encounters in the studio and the conversation with the people is what really uh, feed me in a way. Uh, beyond uh, beyond hierarchy, beyond uh, beyond topics, and I think that the um, the one the one moment uh, that is really rewarding, if I can steal the word from uh, my former former manager, is that moment that you feel that you are thinking together. So that moment in which you are together with other people, and you feel that you are building on top of what the others are saying. And you arrive to a point that you would have never been able to arrive just by yourself. So that idea that you are creating something that is greater than the minds that are around, uh, it's, uh, it's impressive. And when you see it, when you leave it, it's something that is so rewarding. Thank you, Chiara. You started your career in the early 2000s. What is different now compared to when you started 20 years ago in the interaction and service design fields? Are they still fascinating exploration territories for you? But I think we, 
we might have answered that uh, a bit, but if we if we reflect, I think on the on the journey, right? Um, service design, interaction design, or user experience, or however we want to call all of them, we can put even design research at the time was very nascent. Uh, now they are very established. And uh, we know by uh, our Forrester report that they will keep growing and growing and growing. And who knows how those are going to be filled <laughs> because the universities are not catching up, right? Um, we have established curriculums. Uh, schools are teaching more and more. And we also have established toolkits. A lot of them, they come and go, the sketch and the Figma, and it used to be, I think I forgot some of them. There was a wireframing tool uh, that I, I started working on it that I even don't remember the name, but we have lots of tools and that can enable us to do amazing prototyping, for example. And we have even very solid processes. So those are, for me, an incredible starting point. So what is fascinating today is that you start from something that is defined and you can break it up and recombine it in different manners because the challenges that you're facing, some are old, but also you can approach them in novel manners. And those novel manners comes from cross-disciplinary collaboration, uh, the interconnections, the intersections across industries that used to be very divided one from the other and now are just uh, collaborating or partnering one with the other, the convergence of design and data, the space of the blurring of what is your physical human relationship and the virtual relationship, uh, what you put the kind of fancy name as the metaverse. I think that those are all dimensions or, or territories that we have in front of us uh, that we need to explore. We have an opportunity to explore. We have a lot of tools that we can start with, but those tools are not ready for the new challenge. So mm -hmm. we need to evolve and adopt, uh, evolve uh, those, uh, adopt and evolve those, uh, those tools. So would you say it's time to get bored? I don't think that uh, it's, it's time for it. So that, I think that that's the fun part of being uh, in design, being the generation that is kind of leaving this uh, explosion of uh, design and societal transformation. So yes, many, many, and many more will come at a speed that will probably struggle to catch up. Thank you for your answer. I have now a more serious question, if you want. What is your point of view uh, on design leadership? Do you think this will be really a distinctive skill for the designer in the future, or maybe right, right now? Yeah, I think we spoke a little bit in our, in our so me, me and Silvio sometimes meet for coffee or just with family for lunch, and we end up always talking about topics that are related to design because it's just so interweaved to our, to our life. And I think this yeah. topic of the design leadership, I think is, one that is very hard for, for both of us. So if you think about the, so this design, design thinking, uh, sometimes buzzword, uh, um, as a positive and negatives. I have a lot of personal conflict with the, just the definition of design thinking, but I think that what it made for all of us is elevating the visibility of design to the decision-making rooms. And this means that uh, there is an attention to design and design becoming an important asset in influencing strategic business decision and with a potential important impact on the business outcomes. Now, this means that we have an incredible power because we are asked to say something to new stakeholders. So we have a potential to drive even bigger impact. And we have a lot of responsibility associated to this new role that we need to play. But this also means that we play in a playground that is not ours. It's not what we are, honestly, it's not what we are trained for at schools. We have business people that are trained on design. We still have very little designers that are trained on, not that much, business modeling, but really on influencing decision-making, managing stakeholders, having, I say, we have a seat at the table, but we don't have yet the right voice. 
how do you speak with those stakeholders and what is convincing for them in order to uh, embrace uh, the journey that is always a journey of uncertainty that you put in front of them. So I think that leading, leading the conversations on those decision tables is tough, um, requires new skills, requires a much more deeper understanding of business, requires ability to influence the decision making, but at the same time requires that we don't lose the focus of what design brings and even the importance of the craft. So I think that the challenge that we're facing today is the ones of balancing strategy and craft. And I think that not, we are, I don't think that we're ready yet, but this is a question that is asked to us now. I really appreciate your, your answer. Thank you again. What is your perspective looking forward, specifically in the design industry you work in? Which evolution scenarios will be more likely to happen in your opinion? So I think there are many, many, let's say, content or topic ev evolution that we are going to support and face. So if you think about the entire sustainable transformation, we have the wave of uh, digital transformation, mm -hmm. now we have the wave of sustainable transformation, and we will have others in the future ahead of us. But I think that the main transformation from a, from a profession perspective, beyond the topics that we are going to focus on, I think is the fact that design changed its role in society and it changed its role in business. So as we just said, design is more and more recognized as a strategic tool within organizations. So organizations are much less willing to give design out, to externalize design as a function because it became important. So you will never give out uh, important and strategic decision for your organization. So this means that big organizations are forming internal design teams in order to execute on the job and are looking at external partners to complement these capabilities because they understand that having only the internal perspective is not going to provide enough divergence of thinking uh, and uh, external inputs. So we, need to we will need to find new ways for collaborating in this new setup. And this is a setup in which the boundaries of who is a consultant, who is an external designer, who is a, who is a client, who is a designer, and who is from other business unit within the, the business, is all going to blur. So it's about us and, and a client working together, but it's also about how a designer that is within an organization is working with a medical affairs person within the same organization to drive innovation in uh, connected health. So I think that these, these blurring of the boundaries and design taking on uh, something that is a bit beyond just the space of design is what is going to inform our, our next, uh, next few years. And that's Again, I think that we're just scratching the surface and we are finding our tools to navigate. All right, Chiara. It's been great listening to you going through your journey. Before ending our conversation and leaving room to Q&A from the attendees, I have one last question for you. Tell me, Silvia. If you could share only one very practical advice with the current and the future Domusac students, what would that be? So, as I said, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's valid for everyone, but that will be my advice. My months is at Domus, if I think of my life in my months, months is at Domus, was just my time at Domus. So I was living the experience of the master fully. It was master from morning to night. And, and I think that that's why I got so much out of it. And I got so much out of it from a content perspective, but also from a personal journey perspective, a relationship perspective. So I think that what I would say is that this kind of immersing, getting engaged, getting fully connected and learning the more that you can and keep learning in through these quick cycles of workshop after workshop, because that's going to give you 
exercise your ability to keep learning. That is one of the only thing that will enable us to navigate this continuous change that design goes through. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you very much for your contribution. Cecilia, I leave the stage to you for the Q&A session. Yes, thank you, Silvio. Thank you, Chiara. It was really a pleasure for me to hear you. Since I know Silvio for many years and Chiara too. Um, and uh, as a Domus Academy, we collaborate with Frog from many years. And it was a really a super pleasure to have you here, Chiara, with us connected today. Since uh, we know that you are super busy <laughs> with the role that you have now, but in general, uh, you, uh, you told me that uh, now after the COVID, after the pandemic situation, you start traveling again. So I think you have many, many projects and uh, tasks to deal with every day. And uh, um, I would like to leave the word to our students, uh, uh, to all our attendees uh, to ask a question or comments uh, to Chiara and to Silvio. So feel free to interact. Uh, you had the chat, the Q&A um, is open. So you can write your question here and we will read the question and uh, Chiara and Silvia will reply. Um, ciao, Josef. <laughs> Josef Foraki is saying congratulations to Chiara for your new role. I think Chiara, you, you know Josef from, from years. Correct. We, I, know each we, other. we met each other, I think, at Damos the first time, but then we had uh, the opportunity to um, work together on a couple of uh, professional projects. I was doing some um, freelancing uh, on, on the side, and I think that we also then just became friends, and uh, Salone del Mobile uh, aperitivo sharer. <laughs> wow, great. Yes, for our attendees who didn't uh, have the chance to meet Josef Orakis uh, till now, uh, just to let you know, Josef is a um, designer. He has a studio in Milano and uh, he studied in Domus Academy as well. So he's, he's part of uh, Domus Academy Alumni Network too. And we hope to see you soon here in Damos, Josef. <laughs> okay, so we have two questions from our students. The first one from Melissa. Uh, Melissa is asking, what are some of your favorite projects while working at Frog? Oh, that, that's very <laughs> difficult. We're going to spend 11 years of projects. Um, maybe one, one of the, I, I don't know if I, if I it's a favorite, favorite is a difficult concept, right? Because it could be favorite for many different things because you like it, because you hate it, because of many different reasons. But one that was very important for me is, um, and, and was one of their early, early projects uh, was um, um, a project on Connected Health that we did. It was my first real project when I joined Frog. It was back at the time with Novartis. And we were trying, they, Novartis just invented into this kind of, connected pill that when you ingest the pill and reach your stomach, it was delivering a signal that you could catch from the skin. So we were designing an ecosystem around this stuff that was made of a connected pill, a patch for post-transplant patients to better have a dialogue with their, with their doctors. It was 2010. So we were trying, we, we designed and investigated and did research and shaped this ecosystem, uh, designed the touch points for the patient and the, and the doctor. There was a messaging framework to motivate people to stay, connect, to stay uh, adhere to the, to the therapy. And then, so it was really intense, emotionally very intense. The setup at Frog was super complex. The topic was very complex and also connected that was something that was very new. Um, and then Novartis decided not to fund it um, because the idea that you shift from uh, selling pills to delivering service is, it was too transformative. So first they didn't have the, the possibility to understand what was the value that a digital solution could take, could bring. And honestly, I still work for Novartis, I work for many pharma companies. Uh, still, they lack the metrics so to evaluate uh, why to invest in digital connected health solution. And then it's also because from you, you research for years on a pill, uh, you make the pill, you ship it, and then it's done. 
while if you work on a service, you ship it and that's the beginning. You need to iterate every month. You need to have people that are responding to the phone. So it's a radical, radical transformation of the model. So what I learned from that is that the, the challenges, and this goes back to the question from, from uh, Silvio about what are some of the challenges that we face is that in order to reach impact, it's not just about designing the solution, but understanding all the implications from a business and organization you have around and bring those that are decision maker on the journey with you to reason. Thank you, Chiara. I hope, Melissa, the, the answer is uh, fine for you and uh, interesting. Uh, then another question. We have a question from Umang Varma. He's a student from product design. Uh, he said, hi, Chiara. Thank you so much for your interesting words. What are your thoughts on decentralization of design? So, Omung, would you um, maybe tell me more um, about what you think about what, what do you mean by decentralization of design? There are many ways in which we can take it. Among, I think you have now the chance to talk. So if you want, you can open your microphone and explain better your question. Ciao, Chiara. Thank you so much for your, uh, your time and your words. And for me, when I think of decentralization, I think of the tools, the, the development of easy to use design tools. And um, even you mentioned the metaverse, which is a very, uh, you know, halfway point between technical design and uh, uh, very, um, uh, you know, almost design as entertainment. So we see the design tools entering the hands of younger people, less academically oriented people. And so the industry is changing. And, and you also mentioned how design is now more strategic and less purely aesthetic. Um, so with that in mind, what do you think is, uh, what are your thoughts on, on the decentralization? How do you see it affecting uh, the industry and your career and also the development of tools? I would say that this kind of reducing the barrier to access the design tools is very fascinating, right? And even the fact that people that are not designer by training can experiment with those tools to generate and create new things that we would not, we could not envision maybe. It's, um, it's, really, it's really interesting. The question maybe is more about the purpose and the reason why you use them and the way in which you expect to how those tools are entering in much more complex funnels or much more complex uh, uh, processes in which they feed or get fed uh, by contributions from, uh, from the others. One, one aspect that I have been observing uh, in the course of the pandemic, which I think is very interesting, I was reflecting uh, with, a, with a team yesterday, is the fact that the, this democratization of access to the design tool that I'm linking now to the easy access to Figma that was a, a salvation for all of us during the pandemic has kind of reduced the barrier of uh, the team that was designing and the team that is reviewing. So more and more you have all of us in the same environment, in the same canvas or in the same, uh, in the same whatever workspace and uh, you are not anymore presenting and someone is reacting, but you are navigating the things that you have done in a much more informal way. And I think that this is a lot of positives because it uh, gets the conversation maybe close to the treaty, close to the treaty points and um, gets more honest uh, reaction from your audience. It has a lot of challenges because preparing a narrative is much easier than navigating client's reaction on the go. But there's also the counter side effect that there is no structure in the way in which feedback and questions are provided. So I think that there are pros and cons and we are all now, as our ways of working has been radically transformed by pandemic, trying to Re reorganize our workflows uh, to take the most uh, benefit from uh, from that. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Mang, for your question. Uh, then we have a question from Jakob Tasker. 
what is one skill, quality, or technique that you have found to be especially important when leading and inspiring designer? <laughs> okay, tough question. Uh, yeah. Uh, I always say that, uh, so one side story. So I really love my, my design team to go and teach at universities because I think that if you're able to manage questions from students, you are ready for all the questions that client can make mm -hmm. because the students make questions that are much harder to answer than the ones that clients make. So uh, it's always a good stress, stress test. So if I think about, about leading my leading teams, um, for me, one, one key point is to listen to them. So the starting point of the conversation is about understanding their perspectives and helping them to see things that in their thinking they have, but they have not seen yet because they don't have that level of abstraction from their own, uh, from their own work. And I think that that element, that bringing the external perspective and helping them to see where they already arrived is one of the things that is critical to empower them to progress uh, through their journey. Then the, the, the other aspect, uh, I, I spend a lot of time in doing one-on-one -on -one coaching on programs. So letting people drive their own uh, journey, letting the new leads to lead the program, but doing a bit of shadow governance in helping them to be successful in doing, their, in doing their tasks. And this is important at the very junior level, but is as important as the lead level. So not, not stepping on top of them, but uh, helping them to step up to the role that they need to take. Okay. Wow, thank you, Chiara. I hope, uh, Jacob, uh, the, the, the replies from Chiara was uh, fine for you and uh, successful. Uh, seems that there are no other questions from our students. Uh, guys, take the chance now since uh, this is a very precious moment <laughs> and you have to take advantage of this uh, webinar uh, at the most. Um, but in any case, by my side, Chiara, it was super interesting for me hearing uh, your words uh, and uh, interacting with Silvio. Uh, I really hope that uh, we will have the chance to see you here in the Mons Academy back uh, soon, in presence, <laughs> possible. Um, and Silvio, for you the same. It was really a pleasure for me uh, to have you here for this Connecting the Dots webinar. And uh, um, if there are no other questions, okay, Josef is writing, okay. We have a question from Joseph for oh. Akis. <laughs> the emergence of blockchain technology reminds me of the earliest days of the explosion of the internet after the advent of web browser, etc. In terms of potential of, uh, for experimental research for new behaviors and relationships, do you share this experiment and uh, is Frog working on design related issue on the blockchain? This is really a... I, uh... I share the excitement. Uh, I have few people that are really freaking out with the, with blockchain <laughs> in the studio, and and yes, we are doing few projects. Uh, but the 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 fun story on those few projects is that the people, the clients uh, that are doing those projects, are also on their side, like kind of freaking out on blockchain. So those are the ones that are more uh, experimental or visionary sometimes on the edge of uh, you know what you're really doing but i think that that's the that's the fun part on when you explore things that are things that are new and also i think by my experience is that this is not yet coming from the coming from real from the big orgs it's still coming uh, uh, from uh, startups or smaller grown-ups let's say so that that environment is an environment where you can take where you can still play and taking a lot of risks. Uh, I think that we are, we have already seen some big orgs that were trying to, or that did some projects on bringing blockchain on some of their insurance products, for example. But I think that the scale of that transformation in those cases has been a very utilitaristic way of uh, thinking of blockchain. 
those that are pushing the boundaries of what you said, what you're saying, Joseph, are still outside of this uh, um, big ecosystem. So that's where the energy and a lot of the fun experimentation is coming. Thank you, thank you, Chiara. Okay, I think uh, we have no other question. And uh, uh, again, I would uh, thank you, you two both, Chiara and Silvio. It was really a pleasure and super interesting conversation. And uh, I wish you all the best for your <laughs> professional uh, career and also personal life, Chiara, and the same for you, Silvio. I hope to see you soon, not only online, and uh, let's keep in touch and have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Stay safe. Stay curious. <laughs> yeah.